Michael, thanks for joining us. Um, you are an ED specialist. Tell us a bit about your current role. Uh, so I'm a consultant in the emergency department and the head of the unit with Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, so um, both working clinically as well as uh, administratively and in the back end around how we run out of power. Great. Well, thanks for making time to join us. So we're talking a bit about uh, the principal diagnosis within ED, which may be distinct from the principal diagnosis uh, for the acute inpatient uh, visit, if required. Um, tell us about what we should be documenting there, because as I understand it, it's not something that's free text. There is a, usually a, a database where you need to pick a specific diagnosis, and that then is a, a really important component of the AACC classification, and therefore the complexity and the funding that comes out of that. So we have a special uh, diagnostic spot in, in our system's problem list for ED diagnosis where we choose our principal diagnosis. We've restricted it down to um, ISD-10 codes and the, and the ED subset of ISD-10 codes. So for every patient uh, visit through the emergency department, they must, we must put in a uh, principal diagnosis, including an ISD-10 code. And where are the, the areas that we could probably improve this? Like where are the common areas that perhaps more junior doctors or those that are less experienced in emergency medicine uh, could, could make improvements to that part of the, of the documentation? I guess the first thing is putting in a diagnosis um, and that's pretty well locked into our system that you must put a diagnosis in. Uh, the problem being then that people will choose sometimes random uh, diagnoses and I guess the, the lesson is the more um, accurate your principal diagnosis is or at least getting it down to the right um, medical system or, or health system um, that's being affected, the more funding we get as a result or the more complexity that is represented in that visit. Mm. I suppose the principle that we talk about a lot in coding matters about being using the most diagnostic terminology possible to get the most specific diagnosis applicable to the patient's presentation um, still applies in ED, although admitting that you know ED is a place of um, a lot of initial workup and often diagnostic uncertainty where um, we still should be trying for a diagnosis um, rather than classifying things as just being the presenting symptom. Is that, is that accurate? It is. Uh, but as you say, often we may not come to a complete diagnosis at the end. Uh, and so we have the balance of not wanting to put a diagnosis in prior to knowing for certain that that is the diagnosis, uh, as opposed to um, putting in what, we, what the presenting complaints are. So we have a balance between the two. If we're not sure of the diagnosis at the end of the ED visit, we'll use a presenting complaint or the a diagnostic code that represents why they arrived. Um, but if we do have more certainty around what the diagnosis is, then we'll put that into place. Sure. So on this slide here, we've got um, a few examples where we're just drilling down on the more specific we can be the better. So rather than just saying an injury, being able to be specific with the type of injury, some examples there, a laceration, an abrasion, a fracture, um, usually fractures obviously more complex and require more intervention, a burn, contusion, puncture wound. These terms are quite reasonably foreign to me as a physician trainee, uh, but much more bread and butter for emergency and also surgical specialties. And, and with that as well, being the most specific with the anatomical location, as I would imagine that the actual location of that injury may factor into its classification and ultimately its complexity as well. Absolutely. So we try and we can put these diagnoses in, um, and whereas you can get ISD-10 codes for unspecified locations, the more accurate we can be in a location, the better it is both for our coding, but also uh, in terms of uh, our um, information in the future because often we refer back to what the diagnoses were during presentations so the more accurate we are the better it is for our clinical information in the future and yep. certainly okay. um, certainly with this uh, you know in terms of injuries and so on I've curated a, a favorites list so actually should I talk about that here yeah tell us about your favorites list yeah yeah so um in terms of injuries and other defining other diagnoses, I've curated a favourites list within our EMR, uh, which is a subset of uh, the diagnoses that we can put into place and they've categorised them down by by system, as in whether it's cardiovascular or whether it's trauma uh, and by location. Uh, and so we can find things a bit easier. Okay, I might see if I can, uh, if you don't mind, I might borrow that favourites list and, and make it available for people not in the EMR, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. Um, and another point that we made on this slide is, is with drug use, which we've, we've talked about in a separate one where we talked about mental health and, and drug abuse and other issues, um, being specific about putting a diagnostic terminology associated with the particular substance. So rather than just saying alcohol use, uh, 
um, you know, or alcohol abuse or cannabis abuse or amphetamine abuse being specific about acute intoxication, dependence, withdrawal, and in some severe cases, delirium or dementia or psychosis related to withdrawal or related to acute intoxication. That's again, just that principle of the more specific diagnostic terminology you can use, um, the better that's gonna be reflecting um, the patient's admission and um, reason for presentation and associated management. Yeah, and the um, effects obviously indicate more complexity. If someone's come in with withdrawal symptoms, they may be more complex to care for than someone who's just acutely intolerant. Absolutely. So again, um, if you watch some other coding matters, we've often talked about expressing diagnostic uncertainty, uh, which you can, if you've got a probable diagnosis or suspected, you can still categorize that as the principal diagnosis. It doesn't mean to be 100% confirmed. Admittedly, some things are still un not completely worked up, and so sometimes it's not appropriate to put that non stemmy when you don't actually have hard evidence of a non stemmy but if you've got a you know likely non stemmy it's not quite yet proved or they left before you're able to confirm that that could still be their principal diagnosis um, which may be then reflected more nuance in the in the free text options of your documentation uh, we've got some examples here um, where there's a lot of commonly used terminology on the left that are kind of non specific terms they're not very diagnostic versus on the right hand side where you can see very specific ones that are able to be coded according to both the ACC classification and also DRG. Uh, what are the ones that really stand out for you there, Michael? Uh, ones that we often use um, that cat bite and, and what the actual injuries are. So having a simple mechanism doesn't necessarily describe the full extent of the injuries. So someone who's had a fall, someone who's been bitten by an animal, that uh, doesn't always extend the injury. So having a bit more information about what the extent of the injuries are is uh, quite important in those ones. And it's also very hard to find cat bite in our coding system. Mm, okay, good to know. Uh, the other one that stands out for me is, is um, you know, delirium and confusion. It's very easy to say, oh, they've disoriented or they're presented with confusion or they appeared confused. That itself is a symptom or a sign. Um, and probably the best one when it's not, when there's no other specific diagnosis associated is a delirium, uh, as delirium can present in many different forms. And ideally, you can find the cause of the delirium and include that in the, the diagnosis as well. So we've got some examples on the next slide that um, show the ACC um, estimated funding value at this point in time. And uh, this is a really interesting uh, contrast between related conditions. So we can see in the first one, we've got convulsions versus seizures and then the funding values there and you can see there's a kind of $400 lift in a seizure compared to a convulsion. Uh, I wouldn't have realised that and a lot of the time I might have personally seen them as, as interchangeable terms but clearly that's not actually the case. Um, and we can see here as well chest pain which is rather generic versus a cor acute coronary syndrome which incorporates several um, related diagnoses does have a difference in funding as well. How do you value these, these differences in principal diagnosis as, as a manager within ED? Well, chest pain is our biggest. I think we're our, our top two biggest ones are people falling over and people with chest pain. So having um, this is an opportunity there, if we can be that bit more specific in our um, diagnosis, then we're going to end up um, being a bit more accurate in our clinical documentation and the information we have uh, available to us in the future as well as you know, a, a side benefit of a small amount of increase in funding. Uh, makes sense, makes a lot of sense. The, um, I guess the difficulty is of course being confident enough to call it a, a, as a diagnosis and this I think where it comes into play your, your uncertainty of diagnosis that even if you're not 100% certain of the diagnosis you can still say I think this is for instance angina. Uh, as opposed to just chest pain unspecified. Mm, absolutely. Um, just before we wrap up, we've got a few um, points that we wanted to make about the general um, nature of, of documentation, not just medical, but nursing and others that are involved in uh, clinicians in the care of patients in the emergency department. Certainly, I've always known you, Michael, as someone that has uh, very high quality um, documentation. Do you want to speak to a few of these points uh, and, and their importance within ED documentation? I guess the importance here is um, that the information we put into place is useful um, for more detailed coding. And this is mainly in, in the group people who are being admitted. And for in emergency, that also falls within our patients going to ECU or to our short stay units. Um, and obviously, the more complexity that is coded out of those visits, the, the more fun maybe we'd have. Um, so there's a good opportunity there for us. Um, and certainly, I've learned some things through this process as well, as you say. I, I write fairly comprehensive notes, but I do use acronyms 
and and one of the things I learned is that the acronym is not always um, understood and enough that they can be coded. Mm. So so being very clear in how you say things, as well as being very clear that we use correct I guess, medical terminology rather than a bit of layman's language. So you, noting that someone is mildly dehydrated, you know, rather than just looks a bit dry. You know, they, um, these are small things and all of them will add some complexity to the story. Uh, so there's a lot of information there. And I guess the, and I guess one thing we don't know, don't uh, pay that much attention to is how much more detail is required, for instance, if someone's fallen over, it's the circumstances of the fall and where they fell and, and who was there with them. And so there's a lot more information that can be used in coding than, than we would routinely write down. Mm, yeah, really well said. Um, well, thanks for joining me, Michael, and thanks for joining me, Jack. We've uh, Just to summarise what we've covered today, uh, we've talked about the Australian Emergency Care Classification, how that's distinct from the Diagnostic Related Group Classification and the essential elements that go into um, coding an AACC presentation. Uh, we've talked a bit more about the um, time of treatment commenced, uh, as well as the importance of a very specific and accurate ED principal diagnosis. And we've talked about some elements of the detail that's really valuable in the way that we document um, clinical notes within uh, emergency. So um, thanks very much for watching and thanks for joining me, Jack and Michael. Thank you, Andrew.